Hi, everybody. I am Johanna Varner. And I'm Patrice Connors. And we are today going to take you on a tour of some of the animals that you might find in this pinyon juniper ecosystem. So we're here today at the Bangs Canyon Trail. And today our video is going to introduce animals as part of an ecosystem and part of a food web. Um, we know that animals are affected by abiotic factors like temperature and precipitation, just like plants are. Yep, and so today we're going to show you some images of those animals in nature, uh, but oftentimes this kind of footage is really hard to capture. So what we're also going to do is take you on a tour of some of the collection areas back at CMU in the biology department to show you some preserved specimens, uh, specimens of jars, maybe some bones and things like that. So we'll also introduce you here in the field to some of the indirect signs like scat, nests, tracks, bones, and even some of the sounds that these animals might make. We can also study some of these elusive animals using uh, techniques like camera trapping. So we'll also show you some footage that we've gathered from some camera traps that we've placed in this kind of ecosystem. Ready to go? Let's go. All right, so now what we'd like to do is introduce you to the animals that we find in this habitat that make up the food web. So remember, all animals are heterotrophic, which means they get their energy and their nutrients by eating other things, okay? Um, and generally, we categorize different animals in these food webs based on what they eat or who they eat. Some of the broad categories that we use to define uh, these types of animals are primary consumers and secondary consumers. Primary consumers are our animals that mostly eat plants, and our secondary consumers are animals that eat other animals. Um, we also have apex predators who tend to be at the top of our food webs, right? So in an environment like this, that would probably be something like our coyote. Um, and um, we can usually tell what animals eat and what role they therefore play in their food web um, based on just watching them, right? We can actually see other sign of them, things like their scat. Um, but for some animal species, in particular mammals, we can tell whether they're a primary consumer or a secondary consumer based on their teeth. We can look at some of these skulls in CMU's collection. So what I have here is a primary uh, consumer and a secondary consumer. And I know which one's my primary versus secondary consumer based just on the shape of their teeth. As you can see here, uh, in our primary consumer, the teeth are very flat, the grinding plant material. Whereas in this hand, I have our secondary consumer where the teeth are much more sharp for grabbing animal prey and slicing meat. <laughs> <laughs> First, we're gonna introduce you to some of the arthropods and invertebrates that live in this habitat. So remember, insects and arthropods are still animals. Um, this is the Jerusalem cricket. It's one of the largest arthropods that you might meet in the Banks Canyon ecosystem. Although it's not, its name is a little bit of a misnomer because it's not actually a true cricket, nor is it from Jerusalem. It um, is an insect that uses its really strong mandibles to eat dead organic material. And um, although it's not venomous, it can still pause, cause a painful bite. One of the really interesting things that Jerusalem crickets do is that they actually, the males, when they're looking for a mate, will drum their large abdomen against the ground, and that will make sort of like a drumming sound that attracts females of the species. Another arthropod species that you will find in the Bangs Canyon habitat is the darkling beetle, and I have some here. So these guys are pretty unique. Uh, they're sometimes called stink beetles because when they are disturbed, they produce a foul stinking smell. But in another unique behavior that these bugs show is that when disturbed, they actually um, stick their abdomen up in the air. They walk around on their front uh, feet and they're actually called clown beetles for that reason because of the way that they randomly run around. Um, there's over uh, 1,300 different species of darkling beetles that are found in the United States and these are just some that you'll see in Banks Canyon. These little guys are harvester ants and you may see a lot of harvester ant nests. They actually dig very deep underground burrows where they feed their young and store food. Um, their burrows oftentimes have little piles of rocks and are actually clear of vegetation right around the burrow. Fun fact, these little guys here that we have in our ecosystem have some of the most toxic venom that's been documented in any insects. It's comparable to a cobra. And here we have the black widow spider. Um, as it 
the name precedes them. The females of this species are the ones who um, have a behavior of what's called sexual cannibalism, where they actually eat, oftentimes they eat their uh, male partner after mating. Um, however, uh, most times in the wild, the males are actually able to get away, and the males are able to tell if a female has recently mated and or might be still full. Um, so while uh, we know a lot about them and we're usually pretty scared of them, um, they do, the females are the ones with the toxic bite. However, it only usually causes some mild pain, maybe some abdomen spasms, um, and muscle spasm, spasms. Um, there has not been a recorded death in humans due to a black widow spider since 1983. So as long as you spell out these guys first, just give them the room. All right, one last arthropod to introduce you to here. These are scorpions. Scorpions are also arachnids, which means that they're more closely related to spiders than they are to insects. All scorpions actually have a venomous sting, so if they sting you with their tail, they can inject some venom. Although they can be painful, very few are really very dangerous to humans. Um, fun fact about scorpions is that they're actually one of the few taxa that is more diverse in the temperate regions than they are in tropics. So we actually have a higher diversity of scorpions here in North America than we would uh, closer to the equator. One last thing about scorpions, they, blue, they glow green under a UV light. That's because of fluorescent chemicals in their cuticle. All right, so now what we'd like to do is introduce you to some of the mammal species that we find here in this uh, pinion juniper habitat. So one of the largest mammal species that you'll find here are mule deer. Uh, these guys are so named because of their really large ears. Um, they are primary consumers, which remember means that they eat mostly plants. Um, we can see this based on the structure of their skull, in particular by their teeth, really flat for grinding, um, and also based on their scat. If you do find some of their poop around, it tends to have a lot of grass and vegetative material in them. Um, some other things about these guys, they are generalist herbivores, which means they eat um, a lot of different kinds of plants and they don't tend to specialize on just any one plant species. All right, so here is our mule deer. We know that it is a primary consumer, again, by looking at those teeth. These teeth are very flat. They're basically all molars for grinding the plant material that these animals eat. Something else we can tell from this skull is that it is um, not only a mule deer because of the antlers, which are shed every year, but it is likely a young, a young mule deer due to the, the size of these antlers. Um, clearly adults have much larger antlers, that's why um, hunters are particularly interested in 10-point deer because they have such beautiful antlers that grow over time. And here in the biology storage room, I have found a giant box of chocolate. Let's see what's inside. Oh man, it's not chocolate, it's poop! And look, here's a bunch of poop from the animals that we find in the Bangs Canyon habitat. So let's take a look. All right, so here we have some example of mule deer scat or poop. And the reason we know it's mule deer is number one, based on its size, and number two, based on its shape. Um, so what we can see here, these are um, not quite marble sized circles, oblong, oval shapes. Something else we notice is what material is made up in that poop, right? So we know mule deers are our primary consumers, meaning they eat mostly plants. And in fact, plant material is what we can see in their skin. All right, another species of small mammal that you might see here in the Banks Canyon ecosystem is the desert cottontail. So named because their little tail is a little white fluff. Cottontails are primary consumers, so they eat plants. You can see this again in their skulls and in their scat. And unfortunately for the cottontail, pretty much everything that eats meat here relies on it as a food source. So they're really important members of the food web here because there's some other very important primary consumers that support those secondary consumers and um, apex predators. So here you can see an example of the cottontail rabbit scat. Diagnostic uh, characters of these scats are that they are actually round. So rabbits produce round scat. Again, rodents produce more pill-shaped scat. Um, so you'll see these round pellets sort of littered evenly across the landscape. However, once you start looking for these poops, you're gonna find that they are everywhere in the Banks Canyon ecosystem. All right, so I have here a skull of a lagomorph, that's a rabbit or a hare in this case, it's a desert cottontail, and a rodent, in this case, the pack rat. 
um, that you'll be meeting shortly. And I just wanted to briefly show you how you can tell the skulls of these animals apart. Um, you can tell from the teeth of these animals that both of them have these flat grinding molars here, with a very flat surface. This tells us that they're primary consumers that consume primarily plant material. Um, and they both have this gap between their incisors and their molars. This gap is called a diastema, and it's a space where the animal is able to hold and manipulate its food. One of the primary differences between the skull of a lagomorph and that of a rodent is going to be in these incisors. The lagomorphs actually have a second set of incisors directly behind the first set, whereas when you look at the skull of a rodent, you'll only find the one set of sharp chisel-like incisors. These teeth are actually very, very long, they're very deeply rooted, and they continuously grow throughout the animal's life, allowing them to gnaw on all sorts of very difficult foods that other animals can't access. All right, so another uh, mammal species that we find here in this type of habitat are wood rats or pack rats. Uh, so these are small rodents that get their name uh, because they like to collect little things. They're kind of basically uh, little kleptomaniacs. So um, they create these nests or middens. They collect not only nesting material, but also a lot of food. And then basically other shiny objects uh, that we don't really know why, but they just seem to collect them, which is a pretty uh, rare behavior that we see across mammal species. Um, so some other things about these guys, they are primary consumers, eat mostly plants. Um, uh, there's different species of pack rats that either specialize or generalize on different plant species. Some are um, um, a, uh, can handle and eat numerous different plant species. Other pack rats usually only eat one or two species in particular, and then we, we would call them their specialists. Of course, we can also identify these species. Um, they're pretty hard to identify during the day because they're nocturnal. They're only active at night, which makes sense. It's cooler at night here in the desert. Um, but you can identify them by sign of their scat. So remember, these are small rodents, which means their uh, scat are more pill-like. Um, and you can also identify them either by their nests. So like I said, they are little kleptomaniacs. So if you basically see these organized piles of sticks or rocks, anywhere then you probably have a pack rat midden or a pack rat nest and then finally um, a cool thing about these wood rats is as soon as one rat leaves the nest and another one moves in so someone's always living in that nest and over hundreds if not thousands of years we actually end up with something that we call a paleo midden and there's actually an example of it here in Banks Canyon which is super cool so up on this cliff ledge you'll actually see a rock that looks pretty different from all the rest of the rocks. And that's because it's not really a rock, it's a paleo living. Wood rats have been living there for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and their urine basically acts to preserve not only their feces, but their plant material, kind of like Jurassic Park amber style. Um, so that is a, a um, example of a paleo midden, which is super cool because a lot of scientists can actually use the information that that urine saves um, to kind of reconstruct or recreate what past climates might have looked like. And those are our pack rats, which are pretty dang cool. All right, there are several secondary consumers here in the Banks Canyon ecosystem, but the one that you're most likely to ever encounter out here is the coyote. The coyote is a secondary consumer, which means, of course, that it consumes other animals. So they eat things like pack rats and the cottontail rabbits that we've introduced you to, but they are also omnivorous and will also sometimes eat plant materials, especially fruits, parts of plants. Um, the coyote has been described as one of the most vocal of all North American mammals, and its loudness and range of vocalizations was actually the source of its binomial name, Canis latrans, which literally means barking dog. So if you are around this area at sunrise or sunset, you may be lucky enough to hear a coyote howling. Coyotes sometimes get a bad reputation for killing off livestock or pets, but actually there are a lot of studies that have shown that, that killing coyotes disrupts their social structure in a way that makes them more aggressive towards uh, human and domesticated animals and um, more likely to change their behavior to be more bold and go after those kinds of prey than they would be if we left them alone. All right, so this is the skull of the coyote. Again, you can tell that this is a secondary consumer because of the shape of its teeth. They're um, very pointy, and you can see that the way that they come together is actually vertically. That's useful for slicing and dicing meat rather than grinding plant material. And you may even be lucky enough to find some coyote scat 
Again, remember our coyotes are one of our secondary consumers in this ecosystem, meaning that they consume primary consumers, so they're carnivores that eat herbivores. Um, we can see this in their scat. Their scat is actually full, instead of plant material, of actually hair of the prey that the animal ate. It's about the size and shape of sort of a medium dog scat, which is because that's what it is. All right, so uh, we hope you guys enjoyed this virtual field trip of learning about the animals that we find in our pinion juniper habitat, and now hopefully you'll be able to identify signs next time you're out here. Yep, so next time that you're out at Banks Canyon in person or checking out the videos on D2L, we encourage you to check out for scat tracks, um, maybe even place a few camera traps of your own. See you next time!